everybody. Welcome to GE Healthcare's short leadership series, AI and Analytics, Enablers of Better Patient Care and Outcomes. My name is Matthias Goyen. I'm a radiologist and GE Healthcare's Chief Medical Officer for Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Last year, we have witnessed how COVID-19 has accelerated the need for and the adoption of digital innovation in the healthcare sector. Hospital CEOs are reporting that they have progressed more in the last nine to 12 months in their thinking about mobile and virtual health than they had expected to for the next couple of years. Patients' attitudes are changing as well. Think about yourself. You don't nece necessarily want to go into a provider for a real physical visit if a virtual visit could work just as well. And I think that COVID-19 has also made clinicians more open to embracing new technologies that can help them work better and smarter. We will hear from our awesome panel today how they are shaping the process of AI adoption for better patient care with real examples of success. We'll hear about the benefits of early adoption of AI, but we'll also hear about potential barriers that need to be overcome to expedite adoption. We'll also discuss the ecosystem that is needed to support the change management process during the transformation journey. And it is now a great pleasure for me to introduce today's panelists. Dr. Claire Bloomfield, Chief Executive Officer of the National Consortium of Intelligent Medical Imaging and CIMI, University of Oxford. Dr. Christopher Alas, CEO of Radiomate, a private radiology enterprise in Germany as well as Dr. Seicht Mahmoudi, radiologist, CEO and owner of HCM Hospital Shahid Mahmoudi in Tizi Ouzou, Algeria. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the panel. So let's Thanks. get right into it. And, and let me ask all of you, this has undoubtedly been a very difficult year for many people. Please tell us a little bit about 2020 from your perspective, what would you say? How has COVID-19 changed the landscape for healthcare in general? And how has COVID-19 impacted your specific healthcare delivery? And how have you and your team been using digital and AI during the pandemic? Claire, would you like to start? Uh, of course, Matthias, and thank you for the invitation to join the panel today. I'm looking forward to the discussion. And CME is an ecosystem, a based approach of collaborators across NHS healthcare providers, academic research groups and industry partners ranging from startups through to large global entities like GE. And so our role during the pandemic has really been around innovation and how we support a response to innovation in pivoting away from where we were focused on other AI initiatives, working with our partners both to create space for them to respond directly in terms of clinical service, but also ensuring innovation is still adopted. That's where I'd like to focus now is really on the positives we've seen emerge out of the pandemic. So the things I think we'd like to keep. We've seen an increase in innovation, the speed of adoption of innovation, given the fact that there was a common purpose, everybody was directed to how do we tackle the pandemic and use the tools in our arsenal to make sure we were responding as efficiently and effectively as we could be doing. And CME directly has been using some of our funding and expertise to support our company and NHS partners as part of that. So looking at whole body MRI through our work with Perspectum Diagnostics and CoverScan. We were talking about the response to the pandemic. So um, with our partners like CoverScan, with GE in terms of developing retrospective analysis of AI cohorts to see if we could develop AI algorithms. And then also with um, Brainomics, looking at how, how we, we could support, support the adoption and deployment of their e-stroke suite. suite. And, and that was particularly interesting. It, was, it wasn't a COVID use case, case but was, was focused on how could you use AI to remove stroke care from the hospital setting, so allowing stroke clinicians to make decisions and triage patients away from the acute hospital setting. So those have been some of the areas of focus and innovation. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much, much Claire. Um, uh, Christopher, um, how have you been living through the pandemic last year and how have you and your team responded to probably the searching cases or the insecurities. Tell us a little bit uh, where you work, and, you know, what you have been doing and how you probably pivoted during those difficult times. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Matthias, for your introduction. And I'm happy to share a little bit uh, of insights about us as a group and uh, and also how how the, the pandemic has influenced our work. So, um, as you said, I'm a, I'm a radiologist and, and, and I have the role of, of being one of two managing partners of a private radiology and nuclear medicine group uh, in Central Europe, um, Frankfurt, Mainz, Wiesbaden area. We're, we're operating uh, 10 sites in the area and uh, mostly focusing on the uh, ambulatory um, service, but also supplying hospitals. And so we've um, observed the, the pandemic through these uh, two perspectives. Um, and actually the, the um, challenges we faced were, were somewhat different between the uh, phases of the pandemic. So uh, when, when the first wave hit us in, in March, April, um, the, the most obvious thing was a lot of uncertainty um, inside of the, the practice and also with the patients. So we, we've seen a significant decrease in, in demand um, with the first lockdown um, happening. Uh, people chose for themselves, even though we were open um, to rather refrain from doing unnecessary diagnostic tests. And so we've seen a, a huge uh, decrease in demand. Um, also, specifically, certain patients which would um, uh, influence our reimbursement um, significantly. And then, from the uh, perspective of the, the administrative tasks, we we had to um, uh, we had to to manage. Um, it was a lot of um, administrative things like um, organizing all the. Um, um, legal aspects of short labor, um, organizing things were, with our staff and um, uh, measure, um, organizing um, hygiene measures, um, how to, uh, to comply to all of these rules. And then um, we, we also um, significantly uh, needed more time to, to clean up between patients. So that was a significant impact on our productivity. And then the, the second wave actually was uh, a little more uh, smoldering. Um, it, it did have um, a, a different impact on, on certain types of exams. We, we, we did less. And um, um, so this was, uh, this was a, the, the period where we did have uh, most of the cases um, of, of the COVID cases uh, inside our staff and, and all of these um, challenges definitely speeded up um, digitization in our um, practice. We we used a lot of uh, digital tools um, for communication purposes. We um, adapted a messaging system. We moved all the the in-person meetings we were used to 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 uh, web format. And uh, so definitely the pandemic uh, helped a lot to um, accelerate this process and it forced us to adopt things um, which would otherwise have been taken uh, significantly more, more time. Um, yeah, and so I, I think we will come, come back to that point and go into more detail. Thanks a lot, Christopher, for sharing uh, your perspective. Let's now move from uh, Europe to North Africa and uh, to Dr. Mahmoudi. How has COVID-19 impacted your healthcare delivery and how have you and your team been using you know, digital during the pandemic, Dr. Mahmoudi? Uh, thank you, Matthias. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, 2020 has been an exceptional year. In 20 years of career as a radiologist practicing in the private sector, this year is to be registered in the annals of the worldwide health history. In our hospital, at the very beginning of the pandemic, our teams leave it through particular times because we had to adapt quickly to this unprecedented situation where we are facing a virus with very limited information and means to face it, except with just CT diagnos diagnosis, which showed more or less specific lesion on the lungs. 
In addition to this, when the pandemic started, access to PCR tests was long and laborious, showing the limits of our health system. The first patients who received were mostly Algerian citizens who returned from abroad with obvious symptoms. From that moment, our hospital set up a committee to build a specific COVID-19 patient workflow based on survey that our nurse and doctor conducted to make sure that the patient is directed to the right department. You should know that our hospital is mainly dedicated to the treatment of cancer and cardiovascular pathologies. This service never stopped working even during pandemic peak. As a private institution, we were only associated with the diagnostic phase, particularly clinical, biological, and radiological. PCR testing and hospitalization was the responsibility of the public sector. Coming back to our role during this pandemic, it was essentially the referral of suspected patients to university hospital center. At the peak of pandemic, we were doing 100 CT scan a day with a dedicated CT scan only to COVID-19. The second city was reserved for conventional exams and other pathologies. Our medical and surgical activity were never interrupted through the pandemic. We treated and to patient we received. Of course, a pre-admission check was carried out, out in order to avoid hospitalization of patients with this infection. During this period, we have divided an important place to the digital sending and receiving data remotely sending medical results to patient by email, remote reading of radiological image, and so on. Digital technology has also enabled us to avoid the back and forth movement of patient in making appointment and providing information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoudi, for sharing your um, uh, perspective. We'll come back to you um, um, later. Um, uh, Cl Claire and Christopher, you both mentioned that the pandemic has accelerated the application of AI in healthcare. Um, I, I, let me ask you, how is it reshaping healthcare um, delivery? Or, or let me rephrase, where do you personally see the greatest potential for change in clinical settings, leveraging automation and AI, and, and why is that? And it would be great to have some examples where is it already taking place, not only in pilots, but already or very soon um, at, at scale. I'm looking at Claire. Thanks, Matthias. Um, so for us, I think the pandemic has highlighted where we already in the ecosystem already recognised that AI had a significant role to play. So unlike what Dr. Mahmoudi describes, the UK certainly paused a lot of its non-COVID workload. So a lot of cancer and other wait lists were increased as a consequence of the, at least the first wave of the pandemic. And that's being, being rebalanced, rebalanced now. now. But, but we, we knew, knew there, there were, were workforce shortages, shortages already. already. We knew there were workflows inefficiency before the pandemic hit. And I think it's just more acute now that the AI has the potential to fill those needs. The UK ranges from about 30 to 40 percent workforce shortages in terms of radiology expertise. AI has a huge role to play in augmenting and supporting radiologists around workflow efficiency to tackle some of that. Um, as I say, that was a problem before the pandemic. It's The pandemic has made that more acute and obvious. So I think this is where we'll see the first wave of AI applied to help with more of the sort of back office type functions, which will be integrated in a way that patients won't necessarily see, but will help of triaging of images. So we're working with GE around the critical care suite, which is an example of where that will be used to support um, triaging of where there may be an in correct NG2 placement or whether maybe a pneumothorax, but also that beyond that we'll then see the second wave of response to new diagnostics or new interventions where AI can do things that clinicians cannot do alone and so where we can integrate different data sets to derive new insights and drive new diagnostic and interventions using AI. But the first wave is certainly I think going to be in that space of workforce workflow efficiency. Um, and that's an area that I'd hope we see an increased speed of adoption as a consequence of some of the challenges that the pandemic's presented for us. Right. 
Claire, just a quick follow-up question. You mentioned uh, during during the first wave, people people were reluctant also to go into the hospital. What happened to the non-COVID cases? I mean, strokes continued to happen and heart attacks continued to happen, but uh, but probably your doctors, you know, haven't seen those cases, right? We, there was certainly some reticence with patients taking very clearly the advice on board to not come to hospital unless you needed to, but overcorrected, frankly. So there was then an active promotion of encouraging patients to say if you had an acute um, care need that you were still going to come into hospital. Um, Christopher mentioned telemedicine as well. I think that's where we've seen GP practice has been able and enabled in a way that it's maintained um, system delivery as usual, but we know we've seen a drop off in CT scans, MRI, X-ray because of the concerns around throughput and COVID risk in terms of decontamination of the scanners, which means there is now a backlog for less urgent acute care. So cancer being an example of where diagnostics have been delayed or postponed that we know there is a significant backlog. Um, the Reform Think Tank recently published a report actually looking at the implications of the pandemic on the longer term for the NHS, looking at cancer care as an example. So this is where I think AI, I'm going to say this, but is one of the solutions to tackle that problem is how do we use that tool to then help resolve that backlog and support the um, getting us back up, not just to where we were before, but enhancing that. So you're seeing enhanced throughput generally and quicker diagnosis and then intervention as a consequence. Right. Thank you. Very interesting. Christopher, listening um, uh, um, to, to Claire, I mean, and the situation in, in Germany, um, where do you see the greatest potential for change in clinical settings? I mean, and, and, and if you could just give some, some examples of what you have implemented in your, in your private practice enterprise. Definitely agreeing to, to Claire's uh, view on the situation that people deciding for themselves, which is um, urgent or not urgent, and uh, so this this created a lot of um, undulation in the demand, um, meaning that certain things created a, a big backlog, and then we have uh, we have these cases in, in front of us, uh, forcing us to some degree increase productivity to meet that demand. Um, so coming coming back later to that, um, I, I do see a lot of potential for, for uh, not only like really intelligent solutions as, as deeper learning, machine learning solutions, but also uh, digitization in general. And uh, that there are things that, that are still work in progress, um, like um, digital phone contact with some, some extent of automation. Um, then there are things that we use already proactively like um, digital online appointment making, um, and then we're looking at uh, self-service check-in uh, might have a big uh, potential. Um, some predictive analytics like like um, um, prediction of of dropouts and and stuff like that, which is which is already available. Uh, I, I see a lot of potential um, in there. And then since uh, Pixel AI is is, is definitely sort of the holy grail um, where we will see significant uh, support of, of radiologists in the in the future um, i would focus a little bit more on on workflow aspects here because um, um, we def definitely have some automation some intelligence uh, in place that is that is working today and helping us um, for example, um, within the uh, scan process, we have uh, um, the possibility to automate uh, certain tasks like um, automated planning of brain exams. Uh, we do have uh, features built into the scanners like uh, SAR modeling that is working based on AI, helping us uh, to um, apply the perfect, correct ZAR model to a certain exam. Um, which is sort of speeding up uh, the exam by avoiding delays. And then uh, a very, very significant um, innovation that we're using since, um, since, since autumn is uh, deep learning um, raw data reconstruction and, and MR imaging, which is a, a really fascinating technology and, and absolutely a game changer in MR. Um, it is basically um, the, the deep learning based um, reconstruction of MR raw data 
and delivering with the same or less amount of time uh, a higher image quality with less noise, um, less uh, less type of certain artifacts like like ringing artifacts and stuff like that. So um, this has uh, been a huge impact on on our productivity, uh, but. Um, in the situation of the pandemic, not yet really allowing us to do this more patience, but uh, freeing up the necessary time for sanitation, for cleaning, um, for for taking care of patients, asking questions uh, or answering questions. And um, this will, in the future, um, offer potential for, um, for increasing uh, productivity, uh, I hope. And... Um, we will likely see this being available on a broad platform of uh, installed systems. So really looking forward to that. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Christopher. I'm very glad you also mentioned the non-pixel AI part. It seems to me a lot of people focus on the pixel AI, which is of course important, but as you've mentioned, streamlining workflows using using AI is 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 also um, you know very important. And I saw Claire was uh, also a, a agreeing to that. But but let me let me ask you all these tools you are mention you're mentioning you know uh, can can you just buy them and use them or what would you say what are the conditions for success or uh, i asked the other way around what are barriers you have to overcome which challenges right to healthcare delivery could could ai also address is if you could talk a little bit about that claire yeah absolutely um i think AI, to a certain extent, is an evolution of what the healthcare system has been doing already. So, but there are some particular challenges around supporting the piece around adoption. So I think the barriers to adoption come back to how do you support people in adopting AI? AI still needs the people component around it. And where we've seen successful strategies is where groupings have brought together um, an AI working group to think through, have you got procurement, IT, clinical, radiology to IT, like the right players at the table to support the adoption deployment. It's not as simple as I have a new laptop, can I plug it into the system? How that gets scaled, which clinical priorities you're supporting, um, and having a group who's focused on that digital and AI agenda, both for deployment and then for further innovation as it arises. So having a group whose sole purpose is to try and help with that, I think is incredibly valuable. One of the things we see as well is that clinicians can be quite uncomfortable unless there is local evidence that the solution will meet their local needs. And that's something that we've been working with in NCME is how do you provide appropriate evidence that a solution that has been developed in the US or in China, anywhere in the world, can be deployed and will work on the right patient cohorts and will integrate into existing clinical pathways. That's something that we need the ecosystem to work effectively together around tackling. I don't think it's sustainable to have each individual grouping having to test each solution to see does it work locally. So how do we provide the comfort and evidence that's needed even beyond regulatory clearance to ensure that people feel comfortable adopting AI at scale and at speed? So some of that's critical. Um, I think there's also pieces around how do you integrate multiple solutions. So if you want to have your 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 healthcare organisation supporting various AI solutions, how will they all integrate and what does the back office for that integration look like so that you aren't again sitting with multiple servers, multiple virtual machines, all needing to be managed individually based on the different company solutions you're working with. So they're practical challenges, they're not very exciting, but those I think are the bigger barriers to adoption. And as I say, the success or the thing I'd advise is to putting together the right groups of people to make sure you're tackling those from the outset. I couldn't agree more, Claire. And, and just a quick comment from my side, from a clinician's and radiologist's perspective, all these efforts regarding digital transformation are only accepted if it doesn't get more complicated. I mean, the irony is that while the technology is designed to help productivity, it actually can add more work and complexity, right? So I'm looking at, at Christopher, how have you and uh, your, um, your, your colleagues and techs, uh, you know, kind of embraced these, uh, these tools? Yeah, definitely agreeing to the to the to the um, former statements of Claire and, and you. So um, challenges in in 
implementing and adopting um, technologies like this are of course like from a, from a technical perspective the integration of, of certain subsystems so um, every every AI algorithm is, is is a subsystem which needs to be implemented into the um, into the, um, uh, the the clinical um, tool case um, and uh, as, as, as many major vendors uh, have, have recognized, um, it, it can be critical to offer um, um, a platform where, where you can easily integrate and uh, implement uh, certain um, um, pixel AI um, algorithms, for example. Uh, but also if you're looking at the workflow um, solutions, integrating these with each other is uh, bringing together the different data sources uh, necessary for these um, technologies to work um, is, is challenging and and also definitely agreeing to claire's comment on, on legislation and also regulatory uh, barriers if, for example if you if you if you take mammography screening program as an example possibly the the most um, um, uh, the, the perfect a place for AI to take place because a huge amount of, of training data exists, very good data quality for algorithms to be trained. This is possibly also the most challenging um, um, situation to really make it work because of, of, of high legislatory um, 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 yeah. barriers to overcome. Uh, and, and, and there is no there is no reimbursement for most of these technologies. So uh, also you, you need to clarify on a, on a, a business case on, on how to actually adopt these technologies. Um, so these are some, some barriers I see. Um, many, many pixel solutions will, will actually require a lot of validation and uh, for, for, before really uh, bringing them into clinical routine. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Christopher, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mahmoudi. When talking about AI in healthcare, we often hear, you know, how the technology is used to analyze medical images, to accelerate the detection of diseases, early diagnosis, develop new drugs. And uh, can you explain what are the challenges of applying AI at your institution in Algeria? And where do you see the highest impact of AI? Uh, it would be great if you could share with our audience. Uh, where, where do you see you know, the highest potential and what are the challenges? Uh, thank you, Matthias. Excuse me for the interruption with the connection. No, no uh, problem. We are glad you're back. Thank you. All right. Now we have no access to artificial intelligence yet, but I have had the opportunity to attend the presentation on artificial intelligence at international events. A presentation of John Hopkins Hospital and system was brought to me by General Electric team. Like a I think we we lost you. Is that right? At least I cannot hear you, Dr. Mahmoudi. Can help up oh. to speed up diagnostic and treatment. I think our hospital has all the recruitment in terms of technology to adopt artificial intelligence in diagnosis, treatment in oncology, for example, but also in management. Ça coupe. Right. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I, I was just um, um, wondering, um, Claire and Christopher, listening to Dr. Mahmoudi, I mean, they haven't started actually implementing AI, which is no problem, but they, they, are, they are embracing, um, um, you know, the technology, they've been to conferences. So is there any advice? Because it's a journey and you have not only started that journey, you are, you are shaping also, you know, in your institutions, uh, you know, applications of, of AI. Is there any recommendation you, you can give apart from the good fact that it's good to embrace new technology? Any, any, any thoughts on that? Claire? Yeah, so I think it's not dissimilar actually across the globe. There are very few that have actually really embedded AI. It's still early in I think everybody's journey. So I don't think it's late to join the party. I think actually there's a lot of potential, but realizing that potential is still something we're all trying to explore. 
my recommendations and they, they apply broadly is what are the clinical unmet needs or priorities that are going to have the biggest impact and start there that will bring your clinical champions with you in terms of implementation um, and then as i say sort of thinking about bringing the right stakeholders to the table to think about how that is then deployed so rather than a global wholesale digital and ai transformation is pilot something with impact um, i think as christopher has spoken to there's still not a strong evidence base publicly about the the return of investment what will you benefit from in terms of financial or other savings in the ecosystem so the best place to start is where you think it will have significant clinical impact start there and generate your own evidence base and that will help you in terms of deploying more activity as it's appropriate right Christopher, it, i don't know whether you'd agree or whether you've got other suggestions no that, that that's fine christopher any, any, any thoughts? Um, uh, so I, I would also uh, suggest maybe to, to pass it on to Dr. Mahmoudi again. He, I think he, uh, he was interrupted in, in the middle of, uh, of, of, of a great uh, thought. Um, so so doc, Dr. Mahmoudi, any, anything to add to, to, this, uh, to this point? Also, it's good. Okay, okay, perfect. So I was just wondering, many, I guess many of our medical colleagues, they have some reservations about the introduction of, of, of new technology in general and probably uh, especially AI. And they fear that it will lead to a loss uh, of the personal touch in healthcare that is, that is so important, the relationship between the doctor um, and the patient. What, what would you say to that? And can, can you tell us more um, about the value of technology in improving outcomes? Or, or let me rephrase it, how is AI enhancing the capacity of what we can do? Christopher? Yes, I, I definitely uh, think that AI will play an important role in our day-to-day -day, um, um, practice. And uh, I'm, I'm not seeing uh, the radiologist being, being very quickly um, uh, completely uh, replaced by AI, but I, I do think uh, that some of the work we do will, will likely be replaced by AI. So uh, actually, there, there, there are annoying tasks, <laughs> Matthias, you know, so um, <laughs> when, it, when it comes to, to measuring lymph nodes or finding nodules or stuff like that, I'm absolutely happy to pass on this uh, task to, uh, to an AI algorithm. And I think this is likely to happen. So. Um, uh, and, and I think it, it offers the chance to free up some time for us um, to rather spend with the patients, uh, to spend this time with our clinical colleagues, um, to, uh, to, to do the, the thing we're good at, um, um, practice some, some connected thinking and um, some uh, extent to, uh, to actually create benefit for, for the patient. Uh, so this is likely um, something that will that will happen, and I'm uh, um, I, I would be happy. To yeah, see. And, and and ideally AI is like an invisible friend that helps you run faster, right, Claire? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly it. Christopher mentioned um, a tool in the toolbox. That's what you want to see is AI integrated and be one of the things that helps the process. Um, Healthcare professionals want to care. That's why I think most clinicians and other groupings are involved in the profession. It's not to be sat at computers triaging data. So it's how can AI remove those, remove or support those tasks being managed in a way that means that the healthcare professionals are focused on the care of the patients. There's also an exciting opportunity, I think, to support other disciplines engaging in this so radiographers or technologists being able to support and assess images more so how can you help the workforce as a whole all operate at the top of their capabilities and where ai can enable people to do more and then i mentioned that sort of second wave of where ai will help drive new insights so will there be the ability for radiologists and others to generate new information by using ai as another tool so I don't think that the AI is going to remove tasks and then radiologists and others are going to be twiddling their thumbs with nothing to do. There will be new work to do. There will be new insights to work with and there'll be new opportunities to drive enhancements in care. 
I think our job description will significantly change, but I agree with you. If you look what radiologists do, they do much more than just looking at images. Look at the field of interventional radiology and interventional oncology is one of the fastest growing fields. Quite frankly, I cannot see taking an eye over, uh, you know, um, these tasks in the foreseeable future or you sit in tumor boards discussing cases um, with colleagues. These are all, um, 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 you know, um, um, activities where the radiologist, of course, um, is needed in the future. But, but let, let me ask you, do we need to fully understand how AI works in order to embrace this, this uh, to embrace it? This is always like the black box, right? Do I need do I really need to know how the algorithm comes to a diagnosis? Or let me put this to an extreme in the future. Do we need images at all? Because we, we know it's the source images and it's it's the data where the information is. Christopher, as a radiologist, what do you think? Yeah, I, I don't think we do not need to know what's happening inside an algorithm. Uh, I think we're we're likely not able to know uh, what is what is what is uh, happening inside of a, a neural net for example so um the the strategies of of supervised unsupervised learning we're uh, using when we create ai algorithms um, um hides until a certain extent what's actually happening behind the scenes um and i think it's not critical to to know all the mechanics but I think it's critical to know the performance and the behavior and uh, the outcome. And uh, we, we definitely need to exactly know um, how an algorithm is performing on a certain task and um, uh, validate this and um, compare it with uh, also human intelligence. I think that's critical um, for um, a broad um, accept exception and um, embrace of of AI. So you advocate for for something like a hybrid model. It's the physician plus AI and not the physician versus AI, right? Would you agree, Claire? Uh, absolutely. In the same way that I, I don't think we should see it as one versus other. And we wouldn't see this if this was genetic testing or a new pharmacological intervention. It, I think it's placing it in the same kind of language. We don't expect clinicians to understand the ph pharmacodynamics of a new drug that they're prescribing necessarily, unless they've got a specific interest in that for a specific reason. You right. cannot be expert in everything. So it's how do the regulators ensure that the solutions are, um, you can have confidence in applying them in the use of care and that how a clinician assesses that something is reliable. And as Christopher mentioned, it's that clinical evaluation. So how do we ensure that not only is it regulated, but it performs well against real world data sets. It's robust and broadly applicable. And that's an ongoing dialogue for diversity and inclusivity in terms of how solutions are developed and do they scale and serve patient groups at, at scale. And that's a job on all of us in the ecosystem to communicate what the regulators do, how clinicians can have confidence and how we can ensure patients can have trust in AI being used as part of their care delivery. Right, great. So uh, let's take a look at Africa, Dr. Uh, Mahmoudi. I would like to get your perspective of how you see the adoption of AI can help kind of leapfrog healthcare across emerging markets like, like Africa. You've heard the European uh, perspective, but what barriers of adoption um, do you see and likewise what opportunities do you feel AI can help bridge in the short term to deliver better outcomes, be it clinical, operational or financial? Dr. Mahmoudi? Uh, concerning Africa, I will just talk about Algeria, a sure. country I know well. <laughs> The future of all will be promising in certain uh, institution in the private and public sector. The prerequisite for the use of all will be digitalization. In recent years, we have seen the introduction of computed based patient record in the majority of healthcare facilities, even in small clinicals. Digitalization is beginning to take its place in a predominant way. New laws are put in place by the Minister of Health which make computer-based patient record mandatory in all healthcare facilities. We are on a rather promising path. For example, there is a national 
web platform for radiotherapy appointment, which will allow patient to be oriented in an optimal way according to the volume of activity of each treatment facility. This will allow the patient to be oriented quickly and reduce the waiting time. Similarly, the Ministry of Health has set up a national web platform for the registration of the population to the vaccination program where it's managed in a, modern, in a modern way. Many projects are underway in the area of computerization in all economic sector, which will allow information to flow more freely and have accurate health data on national level. The frank with you, Algeria is a country that will be ready in the short term to introduce artificial intelligence in healthcare. Shahid Mahmoudi Hospital could be the right institution to implement artificial intelligence, but today we don't have concretely visibility on how it can be applied in our facility and what could be the short-term outcomes for both patient and the hospital management. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoudi. I, I think it's no problem at all, uh, at all uh, that you haven't started using AI, but the good thing is that, that you are enthusiastic and that you are open to embrace these uh, technologies. And it seems to me like, um, that Algeria, the, the Ministry of Health, is doing a lot of things, as you have just mentioned, to help clinicians to, to get to the next level with regard to digital transformation, right? The, the Ministry of Health is doing a great job, obviously. Of course, yes. Right. So I've I've already seen there are a couple of question um, questions in the chat. We are slowly moving, um, you know, to the uh, Q and A part and uh, transitioning. You know, this is the kind of the end of of the panel discussion. And uh, um, so I have a question for for you, Doctor Doctor Mahmoudi, um, from from the chat. We've we've heard so much about. AI and how it will impact clinicians, especially the radiologists. You have not started, but you will start. Aren't you afraid that um, you know you will be replaced um, by, uh, by 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 AI at some point? Or how do you see that? Obviously not, right? Because you are enthusiastic. Uh, to say today, the artificial intelligence will replace the doctor is going too fast. The immunology relationship is important. We have seen that the positive transfer between the doctor and his patient is very important. It is the very basis of any medical care. Artificial intelligence will not replace the radiologist if only for ethical reason. The doctor will always, will always be there to use this technology for a better and faster diagnostic approach. All we nevertheless remain a valuable tool in the service of healthcare. I don't think the, the, the art, intelligence artificial don't replace the radiologist. That is, I'm biased here, being a radiologist myself. This is this is uh, this is great to hear, and uh, I, I I fully I fully agree with you because if I was mentioning that special relationship between the doctor and the patient, and this will never go away. Quite frankly, if, if I go to, to the hospital, I don't want to get a diagnosis from a computer. I want to talk to a radiologist or to, to another clinical partner. If that person came to, to the diagnosis using AI, that's absolutely fine. But this human interface and the humanize, you know, the AI has the potential to probably humanize AI. I mean, this is really a very important. I'm just looking at the chat and I have a, a couple of questions. Let, let me ask this one here. How do we make sure health businesses are able to securely share their patient medical data with third parties who wish to develop AI-based application? And this is a very important question. And I guess it, of course, depends on, you know, different regulations in different countries. But I'm, I'm looking at Claire and Christopher. Um, can, can you probably share what is happening in the NHS, Claire, how, how, how you are dealing with this data privacy? Obviously, a very important uh, issue. Yes, so it's, I think healthcare data protection is critical and we're I think Europe and the UK have been at the fore of trying to define this and balance the need for innovation against the needs for privacy and protection. I think the question though was specifically about how patients themselves share their data which is 
distinct from what I would say, at least in the UK, which is how health NHS trusts share patient data. So ethically, there's a sense of who does the data belong to, which um, is one that it's very significantly by which country you're based in in terms of perception. But there is good legal structurings around consent, the ethical process by which prospectively data can be collected and used for AI development. Um, so the, the legislative landscape is, is clear if complex and requires a lot of management to work through. Um, I think one of the things we've seen a lot of is how you bring patients and the public with, with you in terms of trust in what you're trying to do and ensure that you integrate patient perspective into the design and then execution of AI studies. So for NCME, we have a patient representative on our board. We see a lot of patient engagement at all of our NHS trust partners in terms of how data is being used. And then also we have our Caldecott Guardian. So each NHS organisation has an individual who is accountable for ensuring that patient data is used appropriately and each data request is considered before any data is shared for any third party use. So the, there is a lot out there to understand, but it's, it's a well structured system, I'd say. It's sometimes strange. On the one hand, people share like on social media, like like everything. And then on the other hand, when it comes to, to, to patient data, some are really reluctant, with, which is their good right, which is fine. So, Christopher, I'm looking at you and in, in your daily um, um, uh, practice. Do you have any any issues or challenges with regard to data privacy and that it's kind of, a, you know, a barrier to to uh, research corporations and other things? So um, coming back to the, to the question, um, I, I think the, um, th there, there is, we, we, cannot, um, we cannot make the claim of 100% uh, data on premise. I think this will not work and uh, it will not help the widespread adoption of AI. So I, I think uh, a data will need to go um, to the cloud for, for certain technical reasons. And I think it is it is possible to do this. Um, uh, there, there need to be uh, two most uh, important um, things to make sure. First thing is um, that data cannot be lost. As we've just recently seen in this huge uh, data center accident, um, if you don't take uh, the necessary precautions, Data may be at risk to be lost, even if you if you go into um, a facility like that. Um, so patient data cannot be lost. And the second thing is uh, patient data need to stay private, and that's um, uh, in, in my opinion, in my opinion, most uh, efficiently being done by um, a pseudonymization um, a process. Uh, so um, patients that go. Uh, outside the institution need to be 100% de-identified and I, I think this is critical uh, and it's doable actually um, again a task to be solved by um, by 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 um, IT uh, or by by solution vendors uh, to make sure there is a platform that takes appropriate care of, of the entity de-identification and, and then I think it's it's doable and it's probably also um, recommendable. Uh, I, I think it's uh, probably not um, not not helping the adoption of AI if if, if the the on-premise claim is is uh, above everything. Can I chime in there, Chris? I was just going to say. Sure. Like Christopher's point. So this is. I'm glad Christopher said what he did because he said we need somebody to help with the de-identification and sharing of data. That's exactly what NCME is there for, is to support these different NHS trusts in engaging in AI development. We've developed open source pseudonymization de-identification software that each of the organizations is able to use. We are gathering that data into then a central data repository to be accessed and shared by third parties. Um, there's this balance of sort of federated learning and what the appropriate solution of how you manage data and information governance. What I'd encourage the audience to think about if their healthcare leadership is what's your data strategy, both for clinical service delivery as well as for research, and then finding the right partners with the expertise to help you deliver that. So don't try and generate everything in house. There's value in being part of a network or a broader consortium because you get economies of scale and you can also learn from those who've already done some of this. So um, 
it's challenging but doable but figuring out what it is you want to be achieving and then work with the right partners to help execute that right that, that's a great point thanks a lot for mentioning it claire i'm, I'm looking at the chat here and i pick uh, i pick another um uh, questions um what are your thoughts on how early diagnostics ai can potentially help to lower costs or to to increase access to care or to renew business model i mean very comprehensive question any any thoughts on that how can ai help um, you know mid and uh, and long term to to lower costs probably i can make an early the early diagnosis and can avoid treatment costs christopher or, or claire yeah maybe um I, I can i can jump in on the early diagnosis um as, as we've said um ai will will enhance the capabilities of the radiologist uh, not not only replacing them but also enhancing so um, AI algorithms will be able to depict features in a data set that the human eye is not being able to depict. So actually, I, I can I think it can increase um, the uh, productivity of imaging itself by um, delivering more um, more more benefit actually from from a, from an imaging test, for example. Uh, and also, it might help to um, to to not perform unnecessary or inefficient imaging for example in, in terms of radiology um, so that's that's possibly two ideas on on, on what this uh, can do to um, increase the efficiency of healthcare in general right claire any 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 thoughts yeah, so I think it's it's not one, it's probably all three. I think there are opportunities where AI will transform care pathways, so where cost savings may arise in other parts of the healthcare ecosystem, which frankly can make it challenging because you're spending money in one area of the healthcare delivery and the savings are realised elsewhere. That's challenging in terms of purchasing decisions and who realises the benefit. In the UK, I think particularly, and across Europe, I'd anticipate where we can make cost savings is where we're going to see um, particular initial opportunities. So can we remove the need for outsourcing for radiologist time by improving workflow, by improving triage? So you save some of the extra costs in the system you're currently spending rather than altering care pathways and driving up other patient benefits. So cost savings to start with, but I would say we'll start to see disruptions in care delivery pathways, which will have much bigger potential savings in terms of earlier detection, diagnosis, removal of long-term care of patients because interventions have been curative in their intentions and their goals. So it's a balance, but this is where I think there is a need for more evidence in the ecosystem of what is the value proposition? What will you do for a healthcare organisation if they implement? And where will the savings or benefits be realised to help people make those decisions? Right. So uh, we have a couple of uh, minutes left and uh, maybe I have a, a final question for, for all of you. Um, and, and that's an easy or very difficult question. So uh, what's your prediction for the future of uh, healthcare? Dr. Mahmoudi. Uh, in the medium time, in the medium time, I think uh, nanotechnology and biomarker and terranostic will be changed and revolutionize the cancer treatment and diagnosis and diagnostic in those in the cancers. Thank you. Uh, Christopher? Yes, yeah, so I, I think in, in um, terms of radiology, uh, we have a we have a, a huge backlog in, in digitalization, <laughs> especially in Germany. And I think this will just just basically take place now. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we will speed up um, bringing, bringing digital and connected services um, to the patients with uh, enhanced capabilities. Um, and with respect to us radiologists, uh, radiologists I, I think in, in five or ten years from now, we, we will not look at any images that have not uh, gone through an algorithm before. Um, so we will have that companion uh, at our site. And we will just use it as a third eye, which which is able to see things we haven't seen before. Um, so that's my my prediction for the mid future. Thank you, Christopher and uh, Claire. You have the the final the final statement here. Uh, so 
I'm going to focus on wellness and health rather than illness. So what I'd hope is technology can see the transformation to focus on earlier detection and intervention, prevention as part of that, and therefore how you can democratise healthcare people are more able to look after keeping themselves well and that more of that becomes directly and personally enabled. So a real complete paradigm shift in the way I think healthcare will look in 10 to 20 years time and that will be technology enabled but so embedded but still public focused, care focused and led by caring professionals. Great, thank you very much. So the future of healthcare is, is bright, I would say. Um, this is a great final statement. I think virtual care empowered by AI is no longer aspirational, so to say it is mandatory. It's a must have component of delivering healthcare in, in the future. And that is something that uh, we've been pushing forward for a while here at G Healthcare together with you, our customers worldwide. Moving forward, I believe that digital solutions powered by AI will become even more important because they are revealing their great benefits, greater productivity, faster availability, less administrative work, hopefully, and the spatial separation of physician and patient. We are kind of undergoing a paradigm shift from why digital to why still analog. And I guess this brings us to the end of our session. I thank our three panelists for sharing great insights on how you see the uh, digital transformation moving forward. And a big thank you, of course, to all participants for taking the time to join um, the, the sessions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to know how to become intelligently efficient, please reach out to us anytime. And uh, we hope to see you in the field soon, COVID permitting. You all have a great day. Thank you very much and bye-bye.